Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and thanks for tuning in, as always. This morning, we'll continue our reading and discussion of Martin Luther's work entitled On the Councils and the Church. On the Councils and the Church. And uh, we'll continue retreating only a paragraph for continuity purposes this morning. And we'll continue where we read, uh, where we concluded yesterday. Martin Luther says, St. Augustine writes to Januarius that the church in his day, only 300 years after the birth of Christ, was already so encumbered on all sides with the ordinances of the, of the bishops that even the Jewish political system was more tolerable. I want to comment that uh, this is in nearly 1,800 years ago, already the comment was made that there were so many ordinances, burdens laid upon the consciences of men as to be intolerable. Imagine how complicated and oppressive Roman Catholic canon law has become since then. Church, The Roman Catholic Church has had 1,800 years to legislate, and to write ordinances and laws. And most of those ordinances and laws in Roman Catholic canon law are spent elevating the papacy to godlike status in the world and uh, usurping the authorities of kings and princes, presidents and potentates all over the world, king of kings and lord of lords. Imagine how oppressive a uh, uh, an institution that we live under today, and yet no one perceives that we are as slaves and vassals to the papacy. All right? He continues, and he continues clearly and plainly with the words, and I won't butcher the, the uh, Latin, I'll just read the translation. It says, quote, they oppress the church with innumerable burdens, unquote while the Jews are burdened only by God and not by men, etc. He also states that Christ desires to have only a few easy ceremonies imposed upon his church, namely, baptism and the sacrament, that is, the Lord's table. He mentions no more than these two, as everyone may read. The books are available, so no one can accuse me of inventing this. But he also weakens this, saying in the same place, quote, no one is obligated to keep all these, but may ignore them without sin, unquote. Now Martin Luther says something profound here. Listen to what he says. He says, if St. Augustine is not a heretic here, I never will be one. Okay? So even St. Augustine, one of the great, quote-unquote, fathers of the Roman Catholic Church and of all of Christendom clearly was heretical on this one point, that we're not obliged to keep even baptism or the Lord's table. So, what do we say of the Church Fathers? The best that can be said of a human being. They may be godly men, but they're fallible just as all men are, and especially the man of sin, the son of perdition, the papacy. All right? So the authority of the body of Christ, the true body of Christ, is not men. It's the scriptures and the scriptures alone. It's not counsels of men. It's the scriptures and the scriptures alone. Again, Martin Luther says of St. Augustine, one of the most revered church quote-unquote fathers in world history, if St. Augustine is not a heretic here, I never will be one. He who takes the statements of many bishops and many churches and throws the whole pile into the fire, pointing solely to baptism and the sacrament, makes certain that Christ did not wish to impose any other burden on his church if that which is nothing but comfort 
uh, if that which is nothing but comfort and grace could be called a burden. When he says, quote, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, unquote, Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, or er, verse 30. That is, my yoke is peace and my burden is joy. And I think Martin Luther has correctly translated what Christ said. My yoke is peace and my burden is joy. That's what Christ expects for the body of Christ. We're not expected to be vassals of a human institution with innumerable laws. Okay, What good is grace if we're all under the condemnation of Roman Catholic canon law in every facet of our lives? How can one appreciate and enjoy the peace and the joy of Christ's liberty when a, we have a tyrant reigning over all of us. He said, yet this fine, sensible man does the great, or as they are called, universal or principal counsels, the honor of dis uh, differentiating them from the other councils and the ordinance of all bishops, saying that one should esteem them, and he writes in the same place that one should reasonably obey the decrees of these great principal councils, since much depends on them. If I may use my own words, solibirima authoritas, that is, it is very useful to regard them as authoritative. But he neither saw any of these great principal councils, nor attended any of them, Otherwise, he would perhaps have written differently or more about them. For not more than four great principal councils are famous and well-known in all the books. The Roman bishops compare these to the four Gospels, as they loudly proclaim in all their decretals. Okay, this is, what, this is a point that we need to comprehend, that the Roman Catholic Church considers the four great councils of history after the Council of Jerusalem, as equivalent to the four Gospels. In other words, equivalent to Scripture. And that's the basis of the Roman Catholic's claim that it is the rock and foundation of the Church. <clears throat> and all it is is an institution of men. Okay, The Roman bishops compare these to the four Gospels, that is, they, com they compare these four great councils to the scriptures as they loudly proclaim in their decretals. And we've already seen Martin Luther has demonstrated, although they laud these four church councils, they don't agree with any of them. They don't acknowledge the contradictions between those first four councils. They don't point out the heresy expressed by the early church fathers and they just go on pretending that the whole world doesn't know the fallacy of all of it. Okay? He says, the first is the Nicene Council held in Nicaea in Asia in the 14th, in, rather in the 15th year of the reign of Constantine the Great, almost 35 years before Augustine's birth. The second was held in Constantinople in the third year of the emperors Gratian and Theodosius I, who ruled jointly. Saint Augustine was still a pagan, uh, was still a pagan and no Christian at all at that time, a man approximately 26 years old, so he could not concern himself with these matters. He did not live to see the third council held at Ephesus, still less than the fourth one in Chalcedon. All of this is reliable information. It is based on history and the computation of years. I had to say these things in order to make sure that the meaning of St. Augustine's statement that the great principal councils must be regarded as authoritative by reason of their importance make to, to make sure it is understood properly. Namely, 
that he was speaking of only the two councils held at Nicaea and Constantinople, which he had not attended, but about which he later learned from writings. At that time, no bishop was superior to any other, for neither the Roman nor the other bishops could ever have brought such a council if the emperor had not convoked them, as is well evidenced by the particular or small councils held now and then in the different countries by the bishops themselves without a summons from the emperor. I judge in my foolishness that the great principal councils derive their name from the fact that the bishops were summoned from all the countries by the monarch, the great chief or universal ruler. Excuse me. So it can be said, and rightfully so, that even those two church councils were not called by the bishop of Rome. He had no power to do so. He had no authority over the other bishops. He could not order them to come to attend a council under his authority. The, the emperor was the only one with the power to convene these councils. Okay? And so the papacy cannot claim authority based on these two or even four councils. He had no power to participate any more than any of the other bishops did. He was called or summoned to these councils just like all the other bishops. So what foundation can the papacy rightly claim as being bishop of bishops? certainly wasn't in the, during the first four councils that Rome lodged so heavily as being the, the, the justification or the precedent for papal jurisdiction. All right? It's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous on its face. And, and why the world won't, won't come to terms with this, obviously they were willing to come to terms uh, with these papal pretensions 500 years ago, why are they not talked about today when the papacy claims to have the power to dictate over the governors of the world? He doesn't have that authority. He never did have that authority. It's all pretended. And, uh, you know, in this case, ignorance is not bliss. We need to be educated about these things, and that's why I'm, re that's why I'm reading this book. Now, Martin Luther continues, he says, history will have to bear me out, even though all the papists get mad, that if Emperor Constantine had not convoked, convoked the first council at Nicaea, the Roman bishop Sylvester would have been obliged to leave it unconvoked. Okay? That's Martin Luther's long way of telling you the Roman bishop at the time had no authority whatsoever to convoke anything. Right, And he said, what could the wretched bishop of Rome do since the bishops in Asia and Greece were not subject to him? And even if he could have done it without the power of the emperor Constantine, he would not have had it meet in Nicaea in Asia so far across the sea where no one respected his authority, as he well knew and had experienced. But in Italy near Rome, or, so, or somewhere else nearby, and he would have had to force the emperor to come. So, there you go. Plainly, if the papacy had had any authority at that time, if the bishop of Rome would have had any authority at that time to convene or convoke a council, it would have been in Rome, not clear across the continent in Asia, and he would have had to demand that the emperor be there. He had no such power. Everybody knows this. Now, I say the same about the other three councils named above. If the emperors Gratian, Theodosius, Theodosius II, and Marcian had not assembled these three great councils, they would have never been held for the sake of the bishop of Rome or all the other bishops. For the bishops in other countries valued the Roman bishop just as little as the bishops of Maine, Trier, and Cologne at the present value each other in matters of authority. Indeed, 
much less. Yet one sees in the histories that the Roman bishops have from the first thickened, ailed, wheezed, and gasped for sovereignty over all the bishops, but could not achieve it because of the monarchs. Okay? This is what Paul preached. The man of sin could not come into the world until the restrainer was taken out of the way. And who was that restraining the rise of the man of sin? The monarchs. This is clearly evident even in Martin Luther's writing. The correct translate, the correct interpretation of that about which Paul spoke specifically, the Antichrist, man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, could not prevail until the restrainer, that is the emperors, the monarchs, were taken out of the way. This is the very reason why even today the papacy calls itself the emperor or, or, or Caesar. Okay? And uh, just arrogated to himself the power of the, of the, of the temporal ruler at the time. Okay? That's how he's taken out of the way. The Pope just simply usurps his authority. Now, he continues, he says, For even before Nice the Nicene Council, they wrote many letters, sometimes to Asia, sometimes to Africa, and so on, demanding that nothing should be publicly decreed without the Roman See. So these letters are still extant. That the Bishop of Rome wrote all the other bishops, don't pass any ordinances, make any decrees, unless I am in the midst. All right, now listen to what he says about this. But no one paid any attention to this at the time, and the bishops in Africa, Asia, and Egypt proceeded as though they had not heard it. Although they addressed him with many fine words and humbled themselves, without, however, conceding anything. Okay? So there was resistance from all the other bishops. When the bishop of Rome, this pompous ass in Rome, stood up and decreed that no one could take action without the, without the bishop of Rome's authority, they simply ignored him. That's history. They simply ignored him. And that's what the world should do today. He continues, he says, this is what you will find when you read the histories and compare them diligently. But you must pay no heed to their clamor or that of their, idol of their adulators. Rather, keep your eyes and your mind fixed on the story and the text. In other words, just like we read the scriptures, Keep your mind and your eyes fixed on the text and just take with a grain of salt anything anybody else ever says about it. Okay? So when you read these histories, read the text specifically. Keep your eyes and your mind on the text of these letters and whatever is said by sinful, fallible, wicked men about them should be taken with a huge grain of salt. Proof's in the pudding. Proof's in the text. The Bishop of Rome was nothing in the world at the time, at least nothing more than any other bishop. And that's what he is today. And I suggest to you that he is the man of sin. If he is anything more or less than any other bishop, he is the man of sin, the son of perdition. The Bishop of Rome is one that sticks out like a sore thumb among all the bishops, and a very, very sore thumb. Continuing, he says, since the word, quote-unquote, council, now enjoyed the profound respect of Christians throughout the world, partly because of the above-mentioned letter of Augustine, and since these fine monarchs or emperors had died, the Roman bishops constantly strove to associate that name, council, with themselves. 
so that all Christendom would have to believe what they, that is the Bishop of Rome, said. In other words, what Martin Luther is telling you, that through all kinds of wrangling and wrestling, the papacy or the Bishop of Rome succeeded in making synonymous the word council with the Bishop of Rome. And this is the very precedent that the papacy demands be observed today, that only the Pope has the power to convene a council. No other bishop, no other group of bishops, no, not even the whole world, nor heaven itself, the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, together have the power to convene a council. Only the Pope has the power to convene a council. And he is the judge of every man, and no man may judge him. Okay? There, there's the precedent set forth for us in history, this arrogant pretension that only the Pope has the power to convene a council. That the name council itself became associated directly with the papacy. He says, the Roman bishops constantly strove to associate the name council with themselves so that all Christendom would have to believe what they said and so that they themselves might secretly become monarchs, that is, rulers, with the help of this fine name, council. Now, Martin Luther includes in parentheses here, he says, I wager that I am here hitting the truth and also their own conscience, if they have a conscience. So, Martin Luther is plainly putting forth the challenge. I've told the truth. You know it. I know it. Everybody else knows it. Your conscience bears witness that I'm telling you the truth, and yet you will still go on with this diabolical pretense that somehow the Bishop of Rome is anything in the world much less the power of God Almighty. Now, he says, and it has come to pass, they have brought it about with their ailing and gasping, so that they have now become Constantine, Gratian, Theodosius, and Marcion, and much more than these four monarchs and their four great councils. So Martin Luther is telling us even 500 years ago, that now the papacy has elevated it up above the church fathers, above the councils, and even above the emperors. This is history that's never talked about in the churches. And this is why everyone is clearly deceived as to who the Antichrist is. This ought to be taught in all the churches. This history is important. This is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And we are deceived, believe, that these prophecies won't be fulfilled until the distant future. See how easily they deceive us when history shows us the fulfillment of these prophecies. Paul spoke it plainly. He who now letteth, he who now restrains will restrain until he is taken out of the way, and then that man of sin shall be revealed. That happened 1,800 years ago. The restrainer was taken out of the way. The man of sin was revealed 1,800 years ago when he usurped the authority of the Caesars. And he's been ruling and reigning over the kings of the earth and persecuting God's people ever since. Don't look for a future fulfillment of that prophecy. You will, and you are deceived. You will be, and you are deceived. We've come to the break. We'll be back with the message. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio, and we'll continue now where Martin Luther left off before the break. Martin Luther says... About the papacy, he says, and it has come to pass, they have brought it about with their ailing and gasping, so that they have now become Constantine, Gratian, Theodosius, Marcian, in other words, they have become Caesar, and much more than these four, uh, these four monarchs and their four great principal councils. It says, for now the Pope's counsel means, quote, I will it, I command it, my will is the reason for it, unquote. Again, this is the precedent, how the papacy has climbed from being an equal among all the bishops to the bishop of bishops, that is the Lord of lords, and now has even exalted his throne above the Caesars and above the councils and above the church fathers and above God himself. And now, when we hear the term council, it literally means the papacy is saying, I will it, I command it, my will is the reason for it. In other words, No council can be convened without the Pope. The councils are convened to serve the Pope and him alone. And this is history. It's absurd. And that the world pays obeisance 
The kings of the earth pay obeisance, and even the churches pay obeisance to the papacy, the man of sin. Otherwise, these histories, these absurdities, would be pointed out in all the churches and in all the government. This is how the whole world has been deceived. That they let this monster in Rome carry on with this pretense. And that the whole world allows it. Okay? Now, he says, but this is not the case in the entire world, nor in all of Christendom. It is the case only in the part of the Roman Empire over which Charles the Great ruled, through whom they attained and accomplished very much until possessed by all the devils from hell, they shamelessly murdered, kicked, and in many ways betrayed several emperors as they still do wherever they can. Okay? The papacy never has ruled over the whole world. There have always been bishops who opposed him. Even the Protestant Reformation was a direct opposition to the papacy. And yet the, st the papacy still claims to be king of kings and lord of lords. For evidence that God is not on the side of the papacy, he is against him. Now he said, but this is enough for now about St. Augustine's comment on the councils. We also want to show that he thought what he thought of the church fathers. In his letter to St. Jerome, also quoted by Gratian in his work number nine, he says about them, quote, I have learned to hold the scriptures alone in errant. Therefore, I read all the others, as holy and learned as they may be, with the reservation that I regard their teaching true only if they can prove their statements through scripture or through reason, unquote. Furthermore, in the same section of the Deacon is St. Augustine's, sta Augustine's statement from the preface of his book on the Trinity. Quote, My dear man, do not follow my writing as you do Holy Scripture. Instead, whatever you find in the Holy Scripture that you would not have believed before, believe it now, believe it without doubt, he says. But in my writings... Should regard nothing as certain that you were uncertain about before, unless I have proved its truth. Unquote. So there, from the mouth of the very man, the papacy so lodged as the one of the Greek fathers of the church that justifies the papacy's arrogant pretensions, plainly says the scripture is the supreme authority and nothing I say is worth the weight of the paper upon it that it's printed unless I have proved it by Scripture. What does the papacy do with the Scripture? Simply wads it up and throws it in the bin. Okay? The papacy's not spiritually uh, justified anywhere in the Scripture. Okay, now... Many more such statements are found in his other writings, as when he says, quote, As I read the books of others, so I wish mine read, etc. I shall let the others' sayings wait for now. The papists know very well that many similar passages appear here and there in Augustine's writings, and that several of these are gained in the Decretum, in other words, Roman Catholic canon law. Yet against their consciences, they ignore or suppress these sayings and set the fathers, councils, indeed even the bishops of Rome, who by and large were very unlearned men, above all of this. St. Augustine must have felt many a shortcoming in the fathers who preceded him because he wants to be free and have all of them, including himself, subject to the Holy Scriptures. Why should he have needed to be so declinatory toward his forefathers, saying, quote, as holy and learned as they may be, unquote? He surely could have said, quote, indeed, everything they write, I put on a level with Holy Scripture, 
because they are so holy and learned. Unquote. But that's not what he said, is it? That's not what he said, is it? Now, he says, however, he says no, as he always says in the other letter to Jerome, who was furious because St. August disapproved of one point in his commentary on Galatians. Quote, Dear brother, I hope that you do not expect your books to be regarded as equal to those of the apostles and the prophets, unquote, etc. May a pious and good man never write letters to me like those of St. Augustine addressed to St. Jerome, asking me not to regard my books as equal of those of the apostles and the prophets. I would be ashamed to death. But it is this with which, which, uh, with which we are dealing now, and which St. Augustine clearly observed. The fathers were occasionally very human and had not overcome what is written in the seventh chapter of Romans. Therefore, he does not want to trust either his predecessors, the holy and the learned fathers, or himself, and undoubtedly his successors much less, who very likely would be less trustworthy. But instead, he wants to have the Scripture as master and judge, just as it was related earlier of St. Bernard that oaks and pines were his masters and that he would rather drink from the spring than from the brook. He would not have spoken like this if he had regarded the books of the fathers the equal of Holy Scripture and had found no flaw in them. Then he would have said instead, quote, it is the same whether it is the same whether I drink from the Scriptures or from the Fathers, unquote. But that's not what he said, is it? He does not do that, but rather lets the brooks flow and drinks from the spring, from the Scripture. <sighs> Got to get back to the Scripture. When we get back to the Scripture, we realize the fallibility of men. All men and especially those men who say that what comes out of their mouth is superior to the Scripture. And that is carried on by no other institution in the world than the papacy. None in history and none in the future. There is only one human entity in all of world history that claims to be superior to the Word of God. That makes him, by definition, the Antichrist. It's the papacy. It can be no one else. Now, if you believe in some future Antichrist to come, then you have to concede that you've been deceived and that you are deceived, and you need to repent of it. Now, Many accuse me of speaking down to my listeners, and I have to admit, once more, just to silence this, this constant claim, I was deceived for 50 years of my life. I believed the futurist lie. Hook, line, and sinker. I not only believed it, but I taught it to others. And I'll spend the rest of my days repenting of it. I now know for a surety who the Antichrist is, and I am every day becoming more and more and more aware of his diabolical history, and I'm becoming even more aware of his current dominance in the world, even over the United States government, the world government, and his manipulation of all the, na all the nations in the world, still clamoring, coughing, wheezing, Self to become the global Caesar. The power and prestige that the papacy possessed up until the Protestant Reformation is being recreated right before our very eyes. And it never would have been possible were it not for futurism 
this cockamamie idea that the Antichrist is not yet in the world. And because it is so universally believed and taught in the world, just as I believed it and taught it, the papacy is free to continue to build his kingdom in the world, and it's in a direct opposition to the kingdom of Christ. And I maintain that the papacy, if thwarted in his attempt, as close as it is now, as fully developed as it is now, if the truth becomes so apparent in the world that the Pope is nothing in the world, then he would allow this world to be annihilated. Nuclear holocaust. A global nuclear holocaust. We've seen the extent to which the papacy has clamored to climb up to the tip-top of world government. And all that have been trampled under his feet since then, like iron tramples the clay. And if something comes between the Pope and his pretentious global rulership, the whole world's in jeopardy if Christ doesn't intervene. He says, what should we do now? If we should take the church back to the teaching and ways of the fathers and the councils, there stands St. Augustine to confuse us and thwart our plan because under no circumstances does he want reliance placed on the fathers, the bishops, the councils, as learned and holy as they may be, or on himself either. Instead, he directs us to Holy Scripture. Outside of that, he, so he says, all is uncertain, lost, and in vain. Okay? St. Augustine, the one that the Roman Catholic papacy would have us believe was the great sage and the great father of the Roman Catholic Church, the great justifier of papal authority in the world, as Scripture and Scripture alone. Otherwise, all else is in vain. What if the papacy told the truth about St. Augustine? What if the whole papacy would crumble, wouldn't it? And that's how easily it's toppled. Why doesn't the world do it? He says, but if we exclude St. Augustine, then it conflicts with our purpose, namely, to have a church according to the teachings of the fathers. For when St. Augustine is eliminated from the ranks of the fathers, the others are not worth much. Moreover, it would be senseless and intolerable not to consider St. Augustine one of the best fathers, since he is revered as the best by all of Christendom, and both schools and churches have preserved his memory above that of all others, as is clearly seen. And yet you force on us the endless trouble and labor of holding up councils and fathers against Scripture and living accordingly. Before that is done, we shall all be dead, and the last day will have long since come. Well... We shall set aside St. Augustine, St. Bernard, and all the others who write in the same vein and take up the fathers and the councils ourselves to see whether we can make our lives conform to them. But we shall take up the very best ones, lest we draw this out too long, particularly the first two principal councils praised by St. Augustine, namely those of, Sa of Nicaea and Constantinople. Along, uh, although he did not attend them, as we said above. Indeed, to play absolutely safe, and so that we cannot fail or worry, we shall take up the very first council of the apostles held in Jerusalem, of which St. Luke writes in the book of Acts, chapter 15, verse 1 through 29, and chapter 16, verse 4. 
it is written there that the apostles boasted that the Holy Spirit had arranged this through them. Then he gives it in the Latin, and here's how it's translated in English, quote, It has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, colon, that you abstain from what is what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from that which is strangled and from unchastity. If you keep yourselves to these, you will do well. Acts 15, verse 28 through 29. <clears throat> That's the scripture. Okay? We just read the scripture. The first council convened by not men, but by the Holy Spirit. Okay? And those are the only burdens that were placed upon the church. Now he says, there we hear that the Holy Spirit, as the preachers of councils boast, commands that we eat nothing that has been sacrificed to idols, no blood, and nothing that is strangled. Now if we want to have a church that conforms to this council, as is right, since it is the first and foremost council, and was held by the apostles themselves, we must teach and insist that henceforth no prince, no lord, no burger or peasant eat geese, doe, stag, or pork cooked in blood, that they also abstain from carp jelly, for there is blood in them, or as cooks call it, color. Okay? And burgers and peasants must abstain especially from red sausage and blood sausage, for that is not only fluid blood, but also congealed and cooked blood, a very coarse grain blood. Likewise, we are forbidden to eat rabbits and birds, for these are all strangled according to the hunting customs, even if they were only fried and, and, and not cooked in blood. Did we, in obedience to this counsel, refrain from blood? Then we should let the Jews become our masters in our churches and kitchens, for they have an especially large book on the subject of eating blood so large that one could vault over it with a pole. They look for blood so painstakingly that they will not eat meat with any heathen or Christian, even if it is not strangled, but butchered most meticulously like oxen or calves, drained of blood and washed thoroughly, preferring to die otherwise. For God's sake, what harried Christians we would become because of that counsel. Just with the two items of eating blood and meat strangled and, uh, uh, and the meat strangled animals. Well then, begin anyone who wants to or can to bring Christendom into conformity to this counsel. I shall then be glad to follow. If not, I want to be spared the screams of Councils, councils, councils. You neither hear the councils nor the fathers. Or I will counter with the cry, quote, You yourselves do not heed the councils or the fathers, since you disdain even the supreme council and the supreme fathers, the apostles. All right? Comprehend what Martin Luther's just done? The papacy usurps itself over the councils and over the fathers and over the scriptures and everything else. And if he puts to preach councils, then he ought to obey, preach, and teach the council of Jerusalem and its prohibition of blood. Yet Europe, all of Europe, all of Christendom, all of popery ate those things that were forbidden by the very first apostolic council held in Jerusalem shortly after Christ's crucifixion. If you want councils and church fathers and all to be the foundation of the papacy, then, well, you might have it, and by it you will topple. Condemned by your own words. You are a papal whoredom. You've got no justification in this world. 
No authority from God or anyone else except those who are deceived. Your sinful, wicked mask for Satan. That's what you are. And that's what you will be until the righteous Christ comes to destroy you. Our David will smite Goliath with a stone. We will all be free. Christ Jesus. That's all we have on the Inquisition Update today. I've been listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. We'll continue tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.